Let's talk about NFTs and royalties. And I'm talking about it in the context of a few exchanges that recently decided not to honor the royalty that was supposed to be attached to the secondary market sales of NFTs. And there's a few things here to unpack. The first is that some people find it surprising. They imagine that the smart contract, the blockchain takes care of it, right? That's the whole point. And it's not, and I'll explain why it can't be. I'll also explain why the concept of a transaction tax is fundamentally ill-defined. And that's why you can't really capture it. That's why you can't really enforce it. I'll also discuss some alternatives to, uh, to this. So the way these things usually work is an NFT will specify in its metadata some information, like who the creator is, what media is associated with the NFT. And they might specify something like, hey, 5% of every sale will go to the creator. And that's something that almost all marketplaces, except for a few that I won't name, are enforcing, right? They're deciding that whenever someone uses their system, they will collect a fraction of uh, the sale and send it to, uh, to the creator. And that's how it works. Why can't you automate it? Well, there's two problems. To automate it, one, you need to detect that a transfer has taken place. And two, we need to know what the transfer price was if you want to have a royalty that's proportional to that. Now, knowing that the transfer has taken place is difficult. You could be looking at, oh, did the owner on the chain change? But that's misleading because if I send it to a cold wallet, oh, now I'm penalized just because I moved to one of, the, one of my wallets. And conversely, I could move an NFT to a smart contract and then change the ownership of that smart contract. So on the chain, it would look like the NFT is not moving, but in reality, the control of the wrapper around it would be moving. So that's a problem. And you could try to go around this by saying, we will ban ownership by uh, smart contracts and you know, we will encourage users not to move it to a different address. But even if you do that, you could still move the NFT to a custodian and just have the custodian transfer the ownership in their own records. So it's very hard to detect that a transfer has happened. And it's also very hard to know what consideration was paid. I mean, sure, maybe you see a payment on chain, but you don't know if it's a whole payment. You know, maybe we both have rare, uh, valuable NFTs, and you know, you sell you, uh, I sell you mine for one test, you sell you, uh, you sell me yours for one test, but that's not the real value. So it's very. Um, it's very tricky to uh, to actually assess that uh, properly. And it's not surprising. Uh, let's make up an example. Imagine you have a country and the country has a transaction tax on real estate. Every single time you sell real estate, the government has decided it will take money from it. And you know what people would tend to do is they'll say, oh, well, easy, I'll take the uh, piece of real estate, move it into a company, sell a company. And the way governments deal with this, because they're used to that, is they will say, well, um, sure, you can do that, but you can't do it if the purpose of the sale is just to not pay the tax and there needs to be a reason for uh, the real estate to actually be placed into the company and so on and so forth. So they'll ask for substance. But at the end of the day, what it, it kind of punts the problem. They'll just say, like, look, a judge is going to look at your transaction. They're going to squint and they're going to decide whether or not you should pay the tax, which, you know, you're not really um, setting rules here. You're just making them as you go along, uh, which might work all right. But there's something fundamentally broken about this. And you're always going to run into edge cases. So what can we do? Well, the first thing is that it's still possible to enforce these through um, social pressure. If you look at the reason someone might buy an NFT, let's say you're buying a piece of art. Why are you buying it? It's not, it's not just so that you can display it on your wall. I mean, maybe you want to do this legally and you need to have some license, but, but really, uh, if you just want to enjoy the art, you, know, you can go to a museum, you can right-click save. There's so many things you can do. It's a way to support the artist. It's a way to also say, I've supported the artist, I own this piece, I am part of this creation, I played a small part in it because I, because I bought it. That's what you're getting. What you're getting is legitimacy. And that's true even if you're doing a secondary market transaction, right? Because someone bought this legitimacy, but they bought it in a form that can be transferred, and you bought that. Even if the first person was not interested in it, even if the first person was just saying, hey, this is in the price, I'm going to buy it, I'll sell it for a higher price, at the end of the day, they acted as an intermediary who helped find the person who eventually decided to support the artist. You know, in some weird way, if you buy today a piece of a long dead artist, 
you're still contributing to that artist's livelihood. How is that possible? You know, like it breaks causality. But it is because essentially you're fulfilling the expectation of people who bought it before you and the people who bought it before you and the people who bought it before you. So a causally, in some sense, you are, you're still taking part of that. Um, so what can be done? Uh, Taints tracking. Essentially, you can look at um, the history of an NFT on the blockchain. You can see where it's been and you can decide that if somehow it's traded through these uh, marketplaces that don't honor royalties or if, you know, it's been part of some dubious, uh, uh, dubious trades, the creator can decide to invalidate it. And I don't mean burn it. Some people have said that the creator should just retain the right to burn the NFTs. That's very extreme. Uh, I propose something much softer than this. You just set, you know, you have a, a bet that says, is it legitimate or not? And you just set the bets like not legitimate. Somehow this has uh, been in the wrong hands or this has not honored royalties. And now some people might still want to buy that, but fewer people, a lot of people care about legitimacy. A lot of people do not want to buy an NFT that's been taken in this way. And all you need is for the value of the tainted NFT to be worth less than what the uh, royalty would cost. Because if that's the case, you know, if you're saying, look, I'm going to save myself a 5%, 10% royalty, but after that, it's going to be worth 10% less, then it's not in your interest to actually not collect the royalty. And that, I think, you know, can work fairly easily. Uh, All you need basically is functionality in block explorers to do that. I'm a little bit of two mind on this because usually 10 tracking is used for nefarious purposes. It's used for um, financial surveillance. But for me, there's a very big difference between financial surveillance where you're breaking the fungibility of money. And that's really bad because you're essentially breaking commerce when you try to do that and tracking a specific non-fungible item, which has a history, which, you know, is its own piece. I think it's fundamentally different. Now, what else can be done? So there's a solution that I really like, and it's called a, uh, a Harburger fee. And it's very unpopular, unfortunately. I don't know if it will ever become popular. I want to present it because I think it presents uh, the right way to do it from an economic perspective. You see, the reason it's so hard to collect transaction fees is because they're not meaningful. It, it seemed, you know, to the human mind, it seems like a transaction thing is a thing, but not really. I can give you a lot of edge cases. For example, let's say that I lend you an item and you use it for a while and you give it back to me. Now, one way you can look at it is say, well, that's just a loan, easy. But another way to look at it is to say, actually, you bought it from me. You just didn't pay me. And then I bought it back from you. We, you know, I had a repurchase agreement, a repo. Like the repo market is a lending market, but repo means repurchase. So does it mean that we actually have to pay the royalty twice when it changed hands? Well, that's weird. It's not really the substance of the transaction. But now we have to look into it and we kind of have to drive this line. And I like to compare it to cutting wood. If you cut wood, um, you can cut wood along the grain or against the grain. And this is exactly what's happening here. You're trying to cut economics against the grain. Economics is trying to tell you that's not really a thing. Like you can't really add this friction and get coherent results. Every single time you try to do this thing, uh, some edge case is going to pop up. And the approach that most politicians have to that is whack-a-mole. Uh, basically, they want uh, a specific transaction tax and they'll say, like, that's how it is. And then you find an edge case that doesn't work in this framework because it doesn't actually capture something um, that's part of the uh, economic ontology. So they'll say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're going against the spirits. And so we'll, we'll patch that and we'll patch that and we'll patch that. As a programmer, this is very infuriating. If you, you know, if, if you're building a program, usually you start by declaring a lot of types. If you're a functional programmer, um, in object-oriented programming, you might declare your objects. And sometimes you'll find that, wait, that doesn't actually match. You're trying and it's kind of like putting a, um, a, a square peg in a round hole. And all of a sudden you'll realize, oh no, F captures a wrong abstraction. And this is why all these edge cases are coming from. And when you capture the right abstraction, you see it. So what we're trying to capture here is wrong because the transaction is not really saying what is a thing and what is more important is value and time. The reason behind those royalties oftentimes, well, if you ask people to explain why is it valuable, is it, is it so important that an artist 
is exposed to the number of times that it changes hand. Why is the number of times that it changes hand meaningful? It's not. What people are trying to achieve with this is giving the artist a chance to have some exposure to the value of the work. Should the work increase in value a lot in the secondary market? If they basically want to retain a little bit of ownership of it in some sense, saying like, look, if this thing is going to be worth 10x in the future, I, the artist, you know, I don't want to have the regret of selling it for 10% of, uh, of that value. So I, I, I want some exposure to that. How, but how do you um, how do you do that? And, and you don't really achieve that with a transaction fee because it could go 10x and a person could decide, you know what, I'm never going to sell it. So the artist is, is getting nothing, no exposure. Whereas something that people just like trading back and forth could generate a lot of royalties. So we're not really getting what we want. What we want is value by time. So there's a concept that I think captures the right abstraction called a harbinger fee. And the way it works is you own an item, but you have to set a price at which you're willing to sell it. And typically I would recommend set your heavy price. It's a price at which if someone comes in and um, buys it from you, then you're still, you're still happy that um, the sale happened. Okay, so you, you set this price, but now you have to pay royalties as a function of that price. Doesn't have to be linear, but let's say it's linear. So you might have to pay 5% of that reserve price that you have to the creator annually. Now, once we do that, we have something that actually captures time, amount of time, multiplied by value. And the reason the value is going to be real is if somehow you try to cheat the system and set too low of a reserve, someone will buy it from you. Maybe, heck, maybe even the artist comes and buy it from you. If you don't pay, then implicitly um, you're setting a very low valuation and someone can come and, and, and snatch it from you. But on the other hand, you also don't want to set the value to be too high because otherwise um, it's costing you a lot, uh, a lot in royalties. It's not very popular because it feels like renting, right? You bought something, you don't want to be spending money every uh, every month or every year on uh, on keeping it. So that's why I think the UX is unpopular. The other thing is there may be fluctuations in the market. And if somehow, you know, you have to pay attention every time to get evaluation and set the price, that can be annoying. But the second part, I think, can be an outsourced. And it's something that's very different when you're talking about something that's, you know, a one, on, uh, a one of one from an artist versus a collection where there's a more established price. And in the first case, I think there's fewer variations. And in the second case, you have better pricing. And so you can automate the mechanism uh, more easily. The other part is, well, it, it lasts forever. And I think that's uh, maybe that's a problem for some people, but that's easy to get around. You could decide that the royalty decreases exponentially over time, or you could decide that it just stops after three years. It also doesn't have to be linear because maybe you never want to part with something. And so you ideally want to set a price of infinity, but you don't want to pay infinity in royalties. So maybe you say, look, up to a uh, $1,000 or uh, that's, you know, you, you pay 5% five, 5 of $2,000, but above that, then it's kept. So that way um, you have the safety of owning it, but you're still going to pay the royalty. So many ways of uh, many ways of, uh, of doing this. I don't know if it'll be popular. You talk to some people and they'll say the UX is terrible. People will never like it. People like transaction taxes. And it's possible, you know. Uh, I don't think human intuitions around economics are usually very good. We evolve in a weird environment where a lot of uh, market economics don't apply, where everything is kind of a semi-monopoly. So it's not surprising that we have this weird view of economics and maybe it's the case that transaction taxes will always be more popular than something like a like a harbinger fee but i would like to see it tried um there's one example of this which is a, a piece by simon de la rouvière called uh, this artwork is always for sale and uh, exactly demonstrate this uh, this principle so to sum it up fundamentally you're never going to have really good smart contract enforcement of something like a transaction fee for royalties. It's socially enforced, but they are social means of enforcing it, even if some exchanges are non-compliant by doing taint tracking. Um, there are alternatives also, like Harbage fees that I'd love to see tried. And fundamentally, uh, for me, the most interesting lesson in all this is when reality is fighting against you, you know, when, when, 
when you see edge cases pop up and you try to patch them, it's telling you something. It's telling you something important. It means you've missed something. And I wish more people uh, paid attention to that. Thanks for tuning in. Um, let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to click like and subscribe.